How come nobody acknowledges when I talk? What about that? Uh, that's a deeper problem than a microphone. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. This episode is sponsored by Component One, makers of Widgmo. If you need stunning UI elements or awesome graphs and charts, then go to widgmo.com and check them out. Don't panic, they'll be paid for most of us. Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 61 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from Iowa. Again? Oh, I guess I was there last time, huh? Jameson. It'll be New York soon. We have Jameson Dance. Howdy, guys. Joe Eames. Hey there. Merrick Christensen. What's up? I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week we have two special guests. We have Joe Fiorini. Hello, everyone. And Yuha Pannen. Yeah, hi, everybody. Yuha Pannen. Thank you for straightening that out for me. We're going to have you guys introduce yourself real quick since you haven't been on the show before. Joe, why don't you start us off? Sure. My name is Joe Fiorini, and I am an interaction developer at Designing Interactive in Cleveland, Ohio. And I do uh, I do a decent amount of JavaScript development every week. And I've discovered functional reactive programming three or four months ago, and uh, it's changed my world. Awesome. And Yuha, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, why not? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Yuha. I'm, um, I'm from Finland, uh, Helsinki. And... Um, I'm a software developer. Uh, I've been doing that stuff for something like uh, 15 years. And uh, uh, for the last five years, I've been working for a company named Reactor. Uh, it's the best best uh, software consulting company in Finland, at least, maybe whole Europe. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an old old dog in, in um, Java development. But uh, in the last five years or so, I've been learning a lot of new, new tricks and now I, I master functional programming, at least to some, some extent. And for the uh, last uh, two years, I've been maybe maybe three, yeah, two two years. I've been learning uh, functional reactive programming, and it's also changed my life. Awesome. So, what do you mean when you say reactive functional programming or functional reactive programming, as well, opposed uh, to just functional programming, which we've talked about on the show before? Okay. Um, uh, a few you, uh, weeks ago, you had you had this uh, show um, about functional programming and. Um, I listened to it and it was, it was very, very good. I liked it very, very much. And, uh, if, if you know what functional programming is, then, then, um, FRP is a bit easier to, to explain. Let's say, um, what, what, uh, functional programming does to, does to lists and, uh, other st- static data structures. The FRP does kind of the same thing for events. So you can, you can apply, uh, functional programming tricks to, um, events. So you, you you kind of lift your uh, abstraction level a bit higher. You don't have to deal with individual events, but instead you you can deal with event streams and you can apply things like map and filter and combine to those streams of events, and that will make your prog- programs much uh, much cleaner and uh, much more functional. Uh, like like n- not so many variables, not so not so imperative. I like to think of um, functional reactive programming as almost like types for your asynchronous operations. So just like you can take two numbers and add them together or take two strings and add them together, um, it allows you to perform operations on two asynchronous processes no matter what they are. So um, it could be a it could be a DOM event a res- responding to a DOM event and then taking the value that you got from that DOM event and converting it to something that you could then send over an Ajax request. But it's all in you know one uh, one really nice functional composed stream as opposed to um as opposed to stringing together a bunch of callbacks sounds awesome i have a friend who um he's really into functional reactive programming and he keeps trying to describe it to me and lots of the things that he says about it um he talks about declarative programming a lot where you're kind of describing the relationship between objects or events or or operations somehow and then whenever they change it kind of reevaluates um, some computation on the fly for you. So you just kind of describe relationships and then the result comes from those relationships. Is that an accurate description of it? 
Well, uh, it so sound, sounds pretty good to me, at least. I think the, the declar declarative versus uh, kind of imperative uh, is, is the one of the things that, that really rocks there. You can do some... It's almost like... Well, I, I like the spreadsheet analogy, you know. <laughs> When you when you use a spreadsheet application like Excel, you can define the contents of a cell using using a formula, and in, the, in that formula, let's say C1 equals A1 plus B1, and that in that formula, the A1 and B1 are not uh, just static values, but they are they are uh, d dynamic values. They are kind of signals, and when whenever e in any of those those values changes, the the value of the C1 cell will will change. So. You can write write a formula, and it will it will be automatically reevaluated re when 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 it has to be. So you you mentioned that there's a lot of use of things like map and filter, etc. From the kind of functional world, are those really even related to the map and filter you find on list events, or are they just used for consistency's sake? Well, um, they they are the same thing. Um, so uh if you have a list and you use map on the list you will um uh, you will get a new list uh, and each of the event, each of the values in the in the original list will will be kind of piped through that that function that you give 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 to map the same thing applies to applies to event streams when you have an event stream and you apply a map function there you will get a, get a new event stream and all of the events in the in the original stream are kind of piped through your your function so it, it's 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 precisely the same thing as, as map for for lists. Awesome. So I, if, I, I have a yeah. very serious question here. Um, okay. If if I were going to pronounce FRP, is it FERP or FRP? <laughs> I, no, I've just always said FRP. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe FRP. <laughs> so can you guys give a little bit of like a, a pulse on the landscape. I know there's like the reactive extensions and then there's bacon JS. What kind of like FRP libraries do you recommend for people who want to get started with this in JavaScript? I can say this so that so that Yuha doesn't have to. Um, bacon. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Is bacon Yuha's thing? Is that your did you create that? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, uh, myself I, I started with with the reactive extensions and uh, that was something like two years ago. When my friend introduced that to me, and uh, it made a lot of sense, uh, it's a it's it's a great li library. But th there were some some issues and some some things that I didn't quite quite agree with or understand, and then then I kind of had to make my own. Coming but yeah, from... Rx is good, and ba Bacon is Bacon is fantastic. You know, there are some others too. Uh, uh, there's there's a library called Flapjacks. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid it, it hasn't been maintained for some time. It, it might be considered dead, but, uh, I, I've only heard good things about it beside of, besides of be, being kind of not upda updated recently. But yeah, I, I recommend Bacon, of course. As I was getting started in, um, FRP, I looked at the reactive extensions and, um, I found them to be, uh, lacking in a lot of documentation. And when it's a concept as new as this, not having a lot of documentation hurts. Bacon had a decent amount of explanation behind all the different, all the different things you can do. Um, the difference between an event stream versus a message bus versus, um, all the other, there's a bunch of different, uh, types in it that inherit from event stream that you can do cool things with like property listeners and other things that just, they weren't very well documented in the reactive extensions that I found were extremely well documented in bacon. So my recommendation would be just pouring through his readme and the wiki if you want to learn more about it. Awesome. Just wondering if it's if it's similar to like you find in Node how you can pipe these events around using read streams and write streams. Is there any correlation there? I'm just curious what makes what is an event stream, right? Like how how can you map and filter these things? Mm -hmm. The the in inter interface uh, for an event stream is uh, is quite quite simple. Uh, it, th th there there is a subscribe method just like in, in any any kind of event em em emitting object. And you, so you can you can subscribe to the the, the stream and and then you will get all, all the events to your callback. So that's that's the same same thing as as, as with, with many other uh, other libraries. Um, 
what, what uh, and, and you're gonna always uh, wrap any any event emitting object into an, an event stream. There's a there's a bunch of different uh, adapters in the Bacon library, so you can you can easily take, for instance, jQuery events or or a Node callbacks. Uh, probably you could easily quite easily wrap, wrap a Node.js uh, stream also in, into an event stream. And what what the the Bacon event stream adds on on on, on top of Top of those event sources is that that it uh, gives them a uniform interface, and you can you can then then apply this. You can com combine these streams, and you can apply maps and filters and flat maps and all kind of things on top of that. Uh, this is at, at, at all explained to you. No, this is that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. You talked about it earlier in a way that sounded like it's another alternative for dealing with asynchronicity, um, similar to callbacks or promises or, or the streams in, in Node is that a good way to think about it? I always thought it was it was a way to kind of abstract away asynchronicity. Maybe that's the same thing, but it, it was just a new connection that this is another way to handle asynchronous things. I think I agree with that mostly. That you know, it is um, it is a really it's a different way to handle asynchronous events, but it is also um, a nice way to kind of abstract away that that uh, control flow that um, you have to. Kind of implement manually in JavaScript using, you know, conditionals or looping. One thing that makes, especially with regards to promises that, um, cause I've actually played with a little bit with, you know, trying to use, trying to use promises as the, in the way that you would use a message bus in something like bacon, where I just want to be able to, you know, trigger an event and then listen on that event somewhere else in my app and without having, without having the two objects depend upon each other. What I learned is the promises are actually right once. So when you, when you resolve a promise, you can't resolve it again, which makes it impossible to listen on a promise multiple times. Whereas with an event stream, you can, you can subscribe to an event stream and you will constantly be getting callbacks. Does that make sense? Yeah, there are yeah, a lot of things that handle. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that the, the property object in bacon uh, is, is a bit like, like a promise. So, um, just to introduce a couple of concepts in, in bacon JS, there's the event stream, which, uh, kind of describes a, a stream of distinct events. And then, then there is a thing called a property. And it's the same thing as, as a signal or, or, or a behavior in some other libraries. And, and, and this is a concept that, um, it's, 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 it's a stateful thing. You can use, use a property to, to model, uh, some kind of, um, for instance, um, mouse position or uh, some some status of a, of a button or uh, the current the number number of bullets in a in a shooting game so it's it's a, it's a, it's a value as a function of time and and, and the property uh, is is a lot like like a like a promise in the sense that, that it, it either has a value or it or it doesn't have a value and you can you can uh, do the same as with, with promises that you can you can fulfill the promise, or you can push push the the value to a property, and then then it will have a, have a value, and every, everyone who's interested in the value of the of the property or the or the promise will get the current value. But but the, the difference between the property and and a promise is of course that the the property can have a chase, changing value. So just like like Joe says, it will it will. It, it's kind of it, it suits be better to situations when 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 some values change pro while while a uh, promise only only can have one one value. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Do you think? Uh, well, do properties give you the error propagation that you find in promises? Yeah, yeah, they do. With, with Bacon JS uh, or many other libraries, you, you can you can compose these these streams and properties in in many many ways. But in, uh, but no, no matter which ways you, you choose, all the errors will, will go, go through the chain. So, so if there, there's an error at, at the source, you will, you will get the same errors through to the final, uh, stream or property. Awesome. So it seems like we've talked a little bit about the idea of functional reactive programming. Can you talk about where you have maybe used it in practice and how it's helped you solve problems? So this is, this is the area where I've still been, um, trying to work it into my workflow. But the one place where I've really used it the most so far, I have a, a couple different, actually. One is a um, so a project that I'm working on that 
I needed a way to, like I mentioned before, I, I wanted a way to be able to, um, essentially I wanted like a, a message bus. I wanted an object that could, where I could just declare properties that were really simple event streams where from one object I could push to them and then from another object I could listen for a value and, um, and just do that over and over and over again. Essentially, like I said, a, a message bus type of object. And what I found was that Doing this with an event stream led me to a really, really simple, very small implementation that worked pretty well for my, for my app. The other place where I've been, where I've been using them, and this is actually not necessarily JavaScript related, but definitely FRP related is a, uh, a Mac app that I'm working on. I'm using a library called Reactive Coco that is this very, very, very similar implementation to Bacon written in Objective C. So I'm using that to essentially instead of when I, like if I have um, menu items that need to be disabled in response, or disabled or enabled in response to an event, instead of having to like, you know, have some sort of lookup or have some extra methods where I can check if this thing should be enabled and if it is, then I can go ahead and enable it. I can just have a an event stream that says when this thing happens. Then one of the things that I want to have happen is to enable. Another thing that I want to have happen is to actually go do run a process. So it's been really nice for allowing me to keep kind of all that code right together in one place rather than having to have it spread out throughout an object or two. Sure. So what kind of projects would you think using FRP would really excel? Do you think any, any you know, CRUD app would benefit from, from trying to implement something like this for their events? Or do you think that there, there are certain projects that you should use this? Nowadays, it seems like uh, I use BaconJS for kind of to solve almost every every problem, uh, you know the hammer analogy. But um, I think uh, when when you write a write a com- complex uh, user inter- interface, which is where there are lots of events, and you you want when 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 you, then, when and you want your user interface to be be really kind of fluent instead of a, um, a traditional old school. Form kind of thing, thing where you press the su- submit button and then you get 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 to see the errors. And so if you want your want your uh, want your uh, UI to respond to every 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 keystroke and and display all all error messages and val- validation in indications in the in the UI wh- while the user is is typing typing their inputs. And if, if you want your uh, say the the submit button of your your uh form if you want want to enable and disable that that uh kind of continuously while while the user is, is typing input to 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 input fields and in that, that kind of situations um uh, reactive programming is, is 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 very nice because you can you can go, com, compose the info, information from di- different so- sources and and easily or assign different side effects to that yeah so complex UIs would be would be one Awesome. One, one, one place at least. There, there are many others. Having, you know, in my, a lot of my thinking about this, what, what I've kind of realized is like, I think it's, I think it's good. You could use it in just about anything. And I don't really think it would be overkill. The downside would be when you have to work on a team. So there's a really great example, um, of Bacon, uh, uh, to do MVC implementation of Bacon. And, um, it's really great for, for, figuring out how bacon works and what what's going on but it's also if you don't understand reactive programming in general it's fairly tough to wrap your you know it'd be fairly tough to wrap your head around until you start until you really understand it and if you're working on a team where some of the team needs to write some javascript but doesn't isn't quite at the level of learning that they've learned a whole lot about frp i think that could get I, I I think they get a little bit difficult, and there might be room to abstract out some of the concepts to so that it's not uh, as hard to look at. It sure. seems like it applies to almost every abstraction, though, right? You're you're choosing mm-hmm. the value of the abstraction, hoping it's better than the cost it takes to ramp up to learn it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just like like I, like I told, it's 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 like when when you have a hammer. Everything looks looks like a nail, and uh, now 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 it's it's kind of native native to me now nowadays to use event streams and properties for for every problems. I'm not saying that they, they are the only only solution or the best solution, but but they they are quite applicable applicable to many many things, especially if you if you like functional programming in in general. 
and they 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 are very nice. I have to say that I don't I don't, uh, I don't get uh, MVC frameworks very well. Uh, they are they're not they are not, not the tools for me. So sure. I actually I was googling some stuff to prepare for this, and I saw that Joe, you had some Ember articles on your blog. Did, have you used Ember with FRP at all, or do you think they're pretty separate domains? I haven't yet. And I don't know, I don't know for sure yet. I think that there could probably be some benefit, but Ember abstracts away so much of the asynchronous work that I think it would be, it would have to be an, it would have to be implemented somewhere in Ember itself. I don't, I don't know that there would be much of a use for it outside of that. Yeah, because Ember, Ember, like, you know, if you, if you call a method, you'll invoke it. And they also defer everything down to like, their run loop. So right. I bet well, you'd be fighting Ember a lot if you tried to bring in something like Bacon. Right. Well, I mean, Ember is a, we talked about, mentioned declarative earlier. I, I look at Ember as a declarative, almost a declarative framework for describing your, your, uh, your UI behaviors. And, um, even though there's a lot of, there is a lot of areas where you can, where you have to write some actual imperative code, but anything that's declarative is going to, you know, that, by its nature is going to abstract away the implementation details of what you're doing. So yeah, yeah I think that Ember probably could get some advantage from event streams, but I think it would be in the framework itself. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think there's much that you could do with it outside of there. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I haven't looked too much into Ember, but what I've, I've understood is that Ember actually is, is quite, quite reactive already. Mm-hmm. You can you can define define these uh, what's called bindings, and then then you can you can make um, you can make kind of computed bindings. So you, you take one binding and apply some function to it, and then you get another binding binding. Right. So 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 it's it's already kind of it, it's already kind of FRP. Okay, that makes sense. That actually helps me understand what FRP is a lot more. Thanks. <laughs> this is something that I've been thinking about is. Um, you know, what would an MVC framework look like implemented with, F- with FRP? And that's like, that's trying to figure out too, because FRP seems very side effect driven. How do you mean side effect driven? Oh, so, well, obviously I, I have like very little exposure to this, but it seems like you, as you're streaming these events, you're just wiring them together with these callbacks and they could potentially be calling, you know, causing side effects throughout the the event stream like you map it you filter it down based on the value or something you convert it to a property get rid of the empty ones and then you once you have that you finally do an assign right which is the end goal but I suppose you could just manipulate the model layer at that point and then have your bindings propagate I don't know I, I don't know how they would play it together so one of the things with with the with event streams is that I I think this is what you mean by side effect driven but Instead of you're not modifying anything, it's just returning new event streams all the way down. But I, I think the the view would have yeah. You know, if if it was an MVC framework, the view would have to be using doing exactly like you said. You know, mapping over DOM values in response to events and converting them to to something valid, and then passing them down into maybe the controller would have messages on it that it could then the the model would just be listening for values and save and save them or retrieving uh, yeah yeah that sounds like that sounds interesting and and that article on the the Knowles blog that I posted a link to kind of touches on how you would turn it into more of a model for the implementation I, I think you write that didn't you Juha did you write the bacon MVC implementation yeah one of them yeah cool uh, I, I wrote, I wrote oh, the one, one, one of them? That, 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 that doesn't use any any MVC fr- frameworks uh, then, then there is one one implementation that used Used uh, backbone models, and that was I think that was that was very nice. Very cool. At, at least at least with, with with backbone, it seems to be pretty easy to to co- combine bacon event streams, and uh, it seems like uh, that that might be might, might be a way a way to go. Awesome. <laughs> this is really cool because I've heard these words before a lot, and they never really sunk in until now. So I think it's finally starting to make sense to me what it is. I seriously feel like I'm talking about mapping the human genome or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Feel like such an idiot this entire show. I, I, f- I felt the same way when I was learning it. You know, I was reading. Um, I read a lot of blog posts. I've read. Um, so I've been trying to learn. I've actually been uh, for the past. It's been a while, a little too long now. I've been trying to learn Haskell, 
and um, you want to feel stupid, try to learn Haskell. <laughs> um, it's it, it actually I feel like I've learned more about Haskell trying to write functional JavaScript than I have trying to actually read about Haskell because it's just so uh, it's, it's, the concepts are so different. So I completely understand. It wasn't until I started looking at um, until I started just trying it myself and just playing with more you know asynchronous heavy apps that I really it, it really started to kind of sink in. Yeah, it's, it's not so much the functional side that, that warps my mind. It's this idea of declarative, declaratively mapping something that's so behavior-driven. Like, mm-hmm. it's so event-driven, and you're mutating all these things based on it, but it doesn't exist yet, you know? You don't really have a data flow. It's like an eventual data. Mm-hmm. It's going to go through, I don't know, it's just, it's just mind-melting. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. This isn't an idea that came from JavaScript, right? Is is this? This seems like one of those old computer science ideas that someone from the fifties thought up, and then it took us forever to actually realize it was awesome and use it in production. Do you any? Do you know anything about where this idea of functional reactive programming came from? I just posted a Stack Overflow post actually that that speaks to that. It came from a paper in I think nineteen ninety eight. Yuha might be able to speak on this better than I can, but holy cow! Yeah, there's quite a bit there. <laughs> I'm not convinced that it didn't come from the Twitter Anywhere API. <laughs> <laughs> what? I feel I smarter just joke. having scrolled through this. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, where did, did uh, FRB come from? Um, yeah, that, I'm not sure which article you are talking about, but it, it might be Cornell's article, and it might be one, yeah, one that, the one. Re- that resulted to, to a certain Haskell, Haskell library. What? It might it might have been called uh, just a reactive. And I think uh, uh, those FR, FR, there's, a, there's a lot of lot of FRP libraries for Haskell already, and some of them are, are, are fairly old. And uh, then there is a library called Reactive Banana, which is I think possibly the the one that's that's most maintained on, on, in, the, in the Haskell world. And uh, that, that's also one one where I, I drew a lot of uh, influence from in, in in the into my own own library. I, I I wrote Bacon first for Haskell, of course. The, there's this reactive uh, Bacon library that I, that I wrote something like two years ago in Haskell, and that 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 helped me helped me um, uh, kind of grasp the the concepts and the and the types and how how how, how you would. D- d- define that library. I'm not sure if I could have done the same without doing it in in Haskell first, because type type system really helps you. Haskell is cool. Yeah, but yeah, the, the roots are probably in 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 Haskell. But if you think about spreadsheets, you know, I think spreadsheets are are FRP already. You can you can do FRP with Excel. So I'm not, I'm not sure. sure if it's <laughs> I'm not sure if it's implemented in in, in an, with an FRP library, but but the the idea is the same. Where you declare these formulas, and then when you change the data, they just update their calculations. That's really cool. Can I just make a side note that Conal uh, document has some really creepy animations on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like the ring tape for it programs. Really is, man, like animated children's <laughs> faces. Oh my gosh. Uh. I'm not making this up, dude. Like horribly clipped out kids' faces just being animated in arbitrary ways. Are we all going to die in seven days? Yeah, that's what <laughs> it feels like. <laughs> A flag crawls out of my computer. Oh, all I'm saying is you can't unsee it. So if you do go to that <laughs> I think it's a little girl who died in an event stream. It seems like. <laughs> <laughs> she haunts it to this day. <laughs> I think this model catches on for further tutorials that use animations of just making them as creepy as possible. <laughs> so it looks like from like Reactive Banana and some of these that what they've done is they've actually been using this for graphical like GUIs and stuff. And and you know, you're talking about the same kind of thing with the DOM. Are are there applications for this that go beyond uh visual media? Mm, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure you could you could use you could use FRP on the server side. I haven't done done much of that so far. I, I've uh, I've written one one run one um, bot for a kind of a, a competition where you have had to write write bots that could, that that drive uh, certain kind of vehicles 
in a in an imagined in one environment and you you have to write, write some kind of artificial ui for uh, artificial artificial uh, intelligence for that and i, I used uh, I used uh, event streams and properties to define that, and I think it's pr pretty nice. And I, I guess in any application where, where you where you have uh, uh, inputs from uh, many, many many sources on the server side, if, if you were, for instance, if you were writing the server side of, of the Skype Skype application, then then you might benefit from from an FRP implementation because it would make it make it easier to co co compose and co combine in inputs from from different sources and uh, technically, it, it, it's it's pretty easy to to wrap any kind of in, inputs into event streams in in a Node Node.js environment, but that's that's something uh, I don't have too much practical practical uh, information yet. So uh, maybe maybe my my next server side application will be written in Bacon, and then I can tell you more. It seems like it'd be a good fit for just responding to HTTP requests, right? Where you just define some relationship between like a URL and then some computation that happens. I don't know. I haven't mm. done it yet, so yeah. I'm kind of making yeah, this yeah. up. But. It seems like it'd be great for the I.O. stuff in Node. So I just actually posted a, um, a link to uh, Substack's GitHub. Um, he has a project called Stream Handbook that um, is using Node Streams, which I don't know the actual implementation and how how node streams differ from event streams i think somebody asked about that earlier but it sounds like it sounds like a, a, a very similar the same concept and um so he has a whole uh a write up on using node streams to do different things like reading from files creating http servers all that kind of stuff and it looks very similar to what we're talking about here i think uh, the the node streams um are still la lacking those those mapping and filtering and flat mapping right. and the combining ca capabilities and that, 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 that's something that you you could add add with FRP and so so you, you would kind of be able to compose information from different sources in, on on a higher higher level. So would you say FRP is kind of the taking the the stream concept and then making it com making them small composable functions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you would, yeah, you would say that. Is there any wrapper? I know there's wrappers for jQuery and all these kinds of things. Is there any wrappers for Node streams for Bacon JS? Mm, I've I've been thinking about writing such a wrapper wrapper, and it, it shouldn't shouldn't be shouldn't be too hard. The problem is that I don't need it. You know the the Node streams uh, they have this in interface where, where you can say stream dot on and then some event like data or end or error I think, and there there is a gen general uh, Mm, adapter in Bacon that, that you can you can use to wrap any 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 so-called on events. Uh, I think it was a Bacon dot um, from e event uh, emitter, and so so you could you could easily wrap wrap a, a single event on on a Node Node.js stream into an, an event stream. But if if you want to want to make a complete adapter for for Node Node streams, you would also have to deal with the error events and. Uh, and the uh, I think end event in in a node stream, but it, it should only be something like five or ten lines of code. Awesome, that's really really cool. Are, are there any other aspects of this that we haven't touched on that we we should go over? Well, maybe how to how, how do you actually <laughs> build things <laughs> with, with with FRP libraries? But that, that's something that's kind of um, hard to explain on the radio. <laughs> it's like I don't know, trying to describe a painting on radio, you know. You should um, you should see it. Are there any good seem, videos on oh, that? Go ahead. They they um, they took a video from from the Mlog JS conference where I was um, I was presenting um, Bacon JS. It was a con conference conference in Bud Budapest, Hungary, and uh, there is a video of that. I'm I'm not quite sure if it's any good. Uh, I haven't kind of I haven't watched it all, all the way. I can't I can't watch myself. But uh, I can I can look up the URL to that, and you can touch by yourself. Seems like this is a really good episode to read the show notes and follow some of the links in there because I've just been browsing them as we've been talking. They're really good, and uh, I mean, at least for me, it took several times bouncing off this idea to understand it a little bit more. So, I think when I was first getting started, I read uh, some of Yuha's blog posts. I think he links to them from the Bacon JS readme. Those are really good too. Um, I actually think we may already have one in there, but 
a, a lot of like a lot of he has some blog posts where he re- I think he explained the concepts decently well. And I'm not just sucking up Yuha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into the picks then. AJ, do you want to start us off with picks? Yeah. So there was some stuff I picked at the very end last week that didn't get into the show, and I'm trying to find the links to it right now. I'm going to pick this slide share slide I'm looking at right now, though. That's on the uh, functional reactive programming. That's pretty cool stuff. Come back to me in just a second. Okay. Jameson, what are your picks? So I have three picks. I haven't been on the show in a really long time, actually. Um, so these have been building up for a while. One is this presentation from Valve talking about how they do the AI in Left 4 Dead. And it's really fascinating because if you've ever played that game, um, the AI is really good. They, they like dynamically change the difficulty of levels and, and the levels are kind of pseudo randomized. So they'll change where like weapons caches are and change where enemies spawn and, and it all reacts to how the player is, is doing. So if it's too hard, if you die a bunch, they'll make it easier, stuff like that. So that was a really interesting read. Um, another one is a blog called programmingisterrible.com. I just stumbled across this and I really liked, um, this guy's writing style and thought he had some insightful things to say about software development in general. And the last one is one that everyone talks up and I've heard it pointed out like dozens of times. I just never got around to watching it. It's, um, a video by Rich Hickey called Simple Made Easy, where he talks about the difference between making things simple and making them easy and how they sometimes conflict and how we should prefer um, simplicity to, to easiness because that leads to less complexity overall. It's really good. Um, he's the guy that is the benevolent dictator for closure, so he definitely talks up closure a lot. But it's it's still a great talk overall, even if you're not a closure user, which I'm not, and I still got lots out of it. Those are my picks. Yeah, he gave that talk or a version of that talk at uh, RailsConf last year. It's pretty good. Joe, what are your picks? All right, so for my first pick, I'm actually going to pick um, my uh, AngularJS Fundamentals course that I just released, kind of a shameless self-plug. Over on Pluralsight, I've been working on this course for like three months with Jim Cooper, and we produced like six hours of screencasts about the very basics of using Angular and really had a fun time doing it. I learned a lot, um, but it's a great way to really get a start, you know, start to using Angular. So I'm going to pick that and a little bit more plugging as well. I'm speaking at two conferences, a couple of conferences this year that are coming up. Uh, Open Source Bridge and Portland is coming up at the end of June. And I'm going to be talking about uh, test-driven development uh, with Angular there. And then also that conference, which we mentioned before, I want to pick it again just because it's got bacon. We talked a lot about bacon today. That was pretty much my takeaway from the conversation was bacon. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been on top of it. Yeah, that conference uh, is going on. I'll be speaking there as well about Angular, and uh, they have a lot of bacon. My, and for my last pick, I'm going to pick uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. Possibly the best Star Trek movie ever. Awesome. Uh, oh, really? Oh, my gosh. It was so awesome. High praise. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was great. You know, in its day, maybe uh, Wrath of Khan was better, but now, nowadays it's a pretty dated movie. So, yeah, Into Darkness was awesome. Really enjoyed it. I actually spent, uh, like, three months prepping my kids, having them watch some episodes of the original series, the second and fourth movies, then this last reboot, um, the Star Trek movie from a few years ago. And then finally, the uh, Into Darkness. They're like 15, 14, <laughs> uh, 10, and 8. So mostly they complained. And then when it was all over, they were really, really happy and loved the movie. So it was pretty funny. So so Joe picked indoctrination along with everything else. Yes. Brainwashing. <laughs> Successful parenting is playing <laughs> music on your kid's iPad. iPod. <laughs> nice. All right, AJ, what are your picks? So I'm definitely also going to pick Into Darkness. I don't want anybody going in there thinking that it's an amazing movie because anytime you do that, it turns out that it's not as amazing as people tell you it is. So I won't tell you that. But I will tell you it's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. I think we're going to go see it tomorrow. And uh, also, there's this site called Server Bear. And if you're looking at VPSs, it allows you to compare all of them in these nice little charts. 
So when you're looking for just like a cheap little ditty to put something up on, you can check it out on that site instead of Googling and looking through the cheap VPS host forums and yada yada. Oh man, that's a gateway to spam bots. That's what that is. I've done that before and it's no good. Uh, yeah, so I like I like Server Bear and it's got even the new ones like DigitalOcean is on there and then you can sort by different parameters. Like you can sort by uh, how much hard drive space you get or CPU or memory. And so I got this one project I wanted to have a lot of hard drive space for. So it was kind of cool to be able to look at that. And um, uh, the thing I talked about last week, the overclocked remix, I failed to mention that you can download all of the songs as well as listening to it on the, the radio portion of the site. Like you can download all the albums on the actual overclocked remix site. And then the Rainwave site, which is the one that has the music streaming stuff, um, it's actually got a Python backend, and it's all on GitHub. And uh, so if you are interested in how that media player works, it's available. Awesome. All right. Uh, Merrick, what are your picks? So I have two JavaScript picks, one really random pick. So I'm going to start with the random one, and that's this guitar amp called the Mesa Boogie Lone Star amp. It's just a, it's just a Oh my stuff. goodness, you have one of those? I do. I didn't even know you played guitar. We have to uh, geek out about guitar stuff sometimes. We do. Sorry. I, I love that amplifier so much. I've had it for actually about two years, and it's just like most of my guitar equipment I get kind of jaded about because it doesn't sound as good as the people I listen to, but that's really just me being bad. But the amp, I have not ever gotten jaded to. I love that thing. My other pick is a project called Backburner.js. What it is, it's the run loop from Ember.js rewritten, and Ember is actually using Backburner.js. So if you're interested in the deferred execution and how Ember can optimize all their bindings to not, you know, if you're doing a for loop and you're changing the model 100 times, they're not going to update your UI 100 times, and that's because of this run loop concept they have, which I think would do tremendous things for about any backbone application. Uh, and then the last thing is we've been internationalizing our app, and there's a project called messageformat.js, from Alex Sexton, and it is just, it's, it's terrific. It's just a wonderful internationalization solution, and it supports pre-compilation, it's fast, supports generating, pluralization, all that kind of stuff. So those are my picks. Awesome. Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, so I've got a couple of picks. I was in this situation where I was working on some client stuff, and I, I got everything set up for their project, and I was getting ready to, to do some work, and my wife came in and said, I've got to go run an errand. You need to go downstairs and be with the kids. Well, my Mac Pro doesn't exactly transport downstairs very well, so I took my laptop and I went downstairs, and I spent all the time setting everything up again, just in time for her to come home so I could go back upstairs and get back to work on my Mac Pro. And then, um, a few minutes later, I got a call from another client, so I switched gears and got things, you know, got into gear and got things going for that client. And then she came in and I had to go back downstairs again. And so I went through the whole thing again. I got, I got tired of it. And at the same time, a lot of this stuff is way easier to set up in Linux than on the Mac. And so, um, I've actually bought another server at digitalocean.com. That's one of my picks is digitalocean.com. They're a pretty inexpensive uh, VPS provider. And uh, anyway, I, I set it up. I installed Emacs. I installed Tmux. Um, and those are my other picks, Emacs and Tmux. And um, so now I'm using a Tmux setup where I basically have one window open. Um, and that's the different frames or whatever you want to, however you want to think about that. Anyway, I have one window open with Emacs in it. Uh, typically have one window open um, just to the command line so that I can run tests or um, run tasks or access the database or whatever else I want to do from the command line. And then um, if I'm working on Ruby, I have guard open and guard runs all my tests automatically and, you know, does all this automation stuff. And so um, it, it works out really, really nicely. And then the other thing I've started doing is I start a TMUX session per client. And so if I'm working on one client stuff, then I just open that session and I can pick up right where I left off. And then if I need to uh, do something for another client, then I just TMUX switch, switch session and then I can just go into the other session for the other client or my own stuff. Anyway, it's been really, really convenient. And uh, I'll put a link to those uh, things in my show notes along with the Emacs um, configuration that I am currently using but modifying. 
Oh, and then my last pick is GitLab. Um, if you haven't looked at GitLab, it's basically an open source version of GitHub that you can host on your own. It's not nearly as fully featured as GitHub, but um, it's a nice way if you don't want to pay for private repos over there, you can just host it somewhere and then do all your Git setup on there. And it was reasonably easy to set up. So anyway, those are my picks. Joe, Joe Fiorini, what are your picks? All right, so I I have uh, two JavaScript pick picks. The first one is um, Flight from Twitter. Um, I don't know if anyone he- here has used that yet, but um, it's their UI framework. Um, I don't want to call it a, an MVC framework because it's it's really not. But I, after giving it, giving it some thought and actually trying to write my own MVC framework, I came to the conclusion that for smaller projects, MVC in general is kind of overkill, and um, and we don't need a lot of what. The, the, there are other things that we could do that might be a little more effective, and I think Flight does that really well, um, especially if you need to do, um, or if you want to do any server-side rendering, Flight makes it really nice. Um, so that's my first pick, but I can't pick a UI framework without um, also picking Ember, because for larger apps, I think Ember really just kills, but I think there's been a lot of talk on here about that, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoy- have been using it a lot and enjoy it. Um, and then finally, I was going to pick Game of Thrones, but I think Joe mentioned that conference, which I just looked up while we were talking, and it's at uh, Kalahari in uh, Wisconsin. Was it? Yeah, in Wisconsin. Yep. Um, so I can't let I can't let that go without mentioning Code Mash, which is uh, in my neck of the woods at the Kalahari Resort in Sandusky, Ohio, and it's a four day conference in January in the middle of the winter at a, the same indoor water park where coincidentally there was all, my company actually sponsors a pretty large bacon bar where we have um <laughs> i think all last year we had together. 25 pounds of bacon oh, and um all kinds of toppings and dip and stuff to to eat with it it was amazing so now um, it's going to sell out oh no last year it sold out in in a half hour i think um, for the 1200, 1200 tickets, it oh. sells out fast. <laughs> I've heard good things about Code Mash. It's a, it's a fun conference. It's a multi-track, lots of languages. It's not, it's not platform specific at all. There's Ruby Talks, Python Talks, .NET, Java, iOS, uh, some Android design stuff. There's all kinds of talks there. Cool. Uh, Yuha, what are your picks? I didn't actually <laughs> prepare too many picks, but, um, uh... For all, all those who uh, who are into Haskell and Monads and stuff, you should check out uh, Brian McKenna's uh, Fantasyland specification, uh, where he d- defines interfaces for monads and functor- functors and applicative functors uh, in, in in JavaScript. And monads are cool, and B- Bacon Bacon JS implements monads, of course. Then uh, there is this uh, great. Uh, Slide set that I already linked linked uh, you to this uh, F- Philip Roberts uh, Roberts Bacon JS slide set, and it it, it can be f- found from the Bacon JS wiki wiki documentation page where, where there's a links to where there are links to some other other nice uh, Bacon JS related postings too, and um, hmm, yeah, it's pretty much ba- Bacon related stuff. And um, you talked talk about the the Star Trek Star Trek movie, and uh, I think everyone should see Iron Sky because it's a Finnish Finnish science fiction movie, and it features uh, Nazis living on the dark side of the moon and attacking <laughs> attacking Earth from there. It's, it's quite far out, but it's it's very very uh, <laughs> very well implemented. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, then uh, yeah. You, uh, it, it'd, be, it'd be nice to see you guys in Reactor Dev Day in the autumn in, in Finland. So reactordevday.fi, I think, would be the URL for that. Welcome there. And thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks for coming for, again. Yeah. It, thanks for having thanks. us. Yeah, this was great. It, it really was. It's it's one of those episodes where I'm going to have to listen to it four times so I can understand it, but really, really good. So, yeah, um, other than that, we'll wrap the show up. We'll catch you all next week.